So we have gone through the whole book. So what we'll do is we'll quickly run through various sections and see how the theme develops in the book. I had given you some statistics also last time, how many sentences Ashwapati spoke, how many sentences Nara spoke, how many sentences the Queen spoke, how many Savitri spoke, and then on the basis of that, we also estimated the total duration of the conversation that must have taken amongst them. And the estimate is roughly three hours, about three hours or so. And if Narad is leaving the palace at noon, it means he must have come to the palace at eight o'clock because after his arrival in the palace, he sings for an hour about the lotus heart of love. He begins his song to the royal host. He sings about the lotus heart of love for one hour. And in that context, heart of love, lotus heart of love, Savitri enters the palace and then the theme starts developing from that point onward. So, it means it was roughly a four-hour session in the morning from 8 to 12, which day that may be a little difficult to pinpoint, but we can certainly say that it was in the summer, in the summer. And we can go a step further and say that it might have been sort of transition between the Indian summer and the Indian rain, monsoon. It could have been in the month of Jeshtha or around June. So which year that we can't say, but it is summer, it is June, and if you go by the Indian tradition, then it has to be the no moon night Amavasya, Deshta Amavasya. And it is on that day also the death of Satyavan occurs one year after Narada makes his disclosure of the death of Satyavan, you see. So that is the little background. Now, where did all that happen? Of course, it happened in Madra, ancient Madra. Now, can we locate where the Madra could be and all that? That is a little difficult question. It could be anywhere in the northwestern part of India. Sometimes people even say it could be somewhere in Afghanistan in those days. And then she crosses all these places and comes down here. But if we go by the mention of the river in Savitri itself, he gives the simile of Savitri, how she grew in the palace, the way a majestic tree grows on the banks of Alakananda. So if that is a sufficient hint, then we could say that Madhura was on the banks of Alakananda River. Alakananda. Now, Alakananda is the tributary of the Ganges and meets the Ganges in the place what is called Deva Prayag in the lower Himalayas. So we can say that in the lower Himalayas on the banks of Alakrananda in the ancient time on some summer day in the month of June at 12 o'clock all these things have happened. <laughs> so that is the 
only kind of detail we can get from the description we have here in this epic you see but at the same time it is a timeless epic it does not really pinpoint a particular geographical location it does not pinpoint a particular moment of time in history it is a sort of a legend which is constantly renewed and it is the renewal of this legend which goes on and on and on and finally culminates into this particular narrative here what we have so the book starts with the visit of narad to ashwapati's palace in silent bounds bordering the mortal's plain so that is the location where narad is living silent bound bordering the mortal's plain between the mortal and the immortal well it is there you have the abode of vishnu himself narad is the devotee of vishnu and he comes from vishnu's abode to the earth and when he is coming to the earth he is carrying the word of fate in a specific context he is carrying the word of fate it means that that word of fate is loaded with the intention power of vishnu himself vishnu who is the sustainer of this creation who carries this creation forward so when he is bringing that word of fate he is really bringing the power of the sustainer into this creation what is it that he wants to sustain he wants to sustain the evolutionary march of this creation forward and it is in that context therefore narad is coming here he is coming with the word of fate word of vishnu himself in that sense now we have here the transitional lines we we'll skip them we have already seen them but the important point is this these few lines here narad is a spiritual being he has a spiritual body he lives in the heavens of vishnu in a spiritual subtle body he is walking into the palace of ashwapati in a physical body how does that happen a spiritual being taking a physical body he is coming he flesh and bones and all that thing <laughs> into the palace how the spiritual get transmuted to the physical by what chemistry it happens that is what we have got here it is by the process of sankhya the five elements by which the material creation comes into existence here akash vayu tejas apas and prithvi that is sky ether then air then fire then water and finally the earth these are the five subtle elements the constituents of the material creation so he gathers these things he transforms his physical body his spiritual body into the physical by employing these elements and then he walks into the palace you see while he is coming he is also singing chanting the name of vishnu 
all along on the path because he is coming with Vishnu's mission, and it is that chant which is going to ring throughout this entire creation. You see, he says he sang the name of Vishnu and birth. That is the most important thing. Sang the name of Vishnu and birth. That is the first song Narada is singing. How does the immortal take the mortal birth? Vishnu, the immortal, how does it take the mortal birth, the human birth? By what transition? Now, we are simply told here, he sang the name of Vishnu and birth. And the birth, uh, how Vishnu, the immortal, takes the mortal birth. Vishnu, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Vishnu, I am generalizing by calling it immortal, the immortal. How the transition takes place. Now, he has simply told us that this is what happens. The immortal is taking the mortal birth. By what process? By what mechanism? By what kind of chemistry it happens? That is not given here. That is not given here. And in fact, the whole process of materialization of the spiritual, how the spiritual becomes material, in what manner? All right, you are saying these five elements, this, 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 but actually, by what kind of a chemistry it happens? That is not detailed out here. That is the occult aspect of the knowledge. And the poet is not writing a thesis on the occultism here. He is simply describing the sequence of operations what has happened. In other words, he knows that Narad is fully aware of the process of this transmutation from the spiritual to the material. The poet assumes that we are also very knowledgeable <laughs> about that kind of a thing. So he is not describing, he is simply telling, look, this is what has happened. And he says, all right, if there are details, you supply those details, because you are aware of them, you see. <laughs> but we are, we are ignorant people, we don't know, you see. In fact, this whole business is here. How the non-material becomes material and the reverse, the material becomes the non-material, transubstantiation or whatever you want to call it. How that happens, that occult chemistry is occult, is occult. And perhaps it is so, because when this was happening, by what process it underwent that kind of a transition, there was nobody to record it. The Supreme knows it, he says, well, he does it. He doesn't bother about the recording and giving that uh, uh, recipe or cheat to you for that, you see. But it's there. The implication is deeper than that. This is not known to us and therefore to a large extent how in the mother's yoga of the cells the transformation is going to occur that also remains unknown. It is there but remains unknown how the transformation of the cells will take place, that also. And the mother says, very distinctly, very clearly, that knowledge has not been given to me. That knowledge has not been given to me. And therefore, she has to work out all the necessary, she has to do the yoga of the cells and discover the knowledge herself. It is by that process only the cells will open out to the Supreme. They have to learn it. 
it has not to be given not to be they have to learn it you see that is the whole intention behind it and therefore that knowledge is kept back knowledge is kept back people like narad they know up to certain extent narad is a spiritual body he can come into the physical body because that process is already established in the cosmic operation so it is possible for narad to undergo that kind of a transformation transmutation but it is impossible that in the present conditions a supramental being would come and deliver a message to say savitri he does not know how to materialize he may operate to somebody he may operate to somebody this primitive being he does not know how to materialize here that has to be worked out so in that sense we are very lucky that narad is not a supramental being <laughs> you see because he can come and do this thing you see and give something at least you see he can receive this supramental knowledge and deliver it to us but supramental being no he can come physically and walk into the palace and give all those things you see you see so we are really fortunate that narad is and he is doing it all in the grace of his vishnu in the kindness in the benevolence of vishnu he is doing all these things to this <laughs> so he sings five songs how five songs of creation first how from the inconscient the whole thing started and ultimately how death will climb to immortality how death will climb to immortality it is the death itself herself himself who is making the progress and he is aware of it he knows the intention of it and then he see the truth that cries from nice blind deeps for what to awake consciousness in beast and men the process of evolution he is describing step by step like that you see he sang the glory and marvel still to be born this is what we have seen last time glory and marvel still to be born of the future this is the fifth song he is singing narad and glory and marvel still to be born to what that bodies become divine and life becomes bliss that is the whole process now and of course the transfiguration and the ecstasy now this is the beauty of narad song he is taking the entire evolution to what point to transfiguration and ecstasy that is what has to happen here you see now this is a new narad he is not the puranic narad puranic narad does not know about transfiguration or transformation or the supramental possibilities or how it is going to work here but narad has done in his world great tapasya great sadhana and now he is getting the knowledge now he is getting the knowledge that well all this is towards transfiguration and ecstasy towards transfiguration so he is what we have here and what we have here is the updated narad <laughs> he has become up to date now shevendu narad shevendu because that knowledge was not there earlier in the puranas in the earlier traditions the idea the, the possibility of transfiguration and ecstasy that didn't exist 
the possibility was only of immortality, not of transfiguration. So in that sense now Narada is singing, so it is something which is now a new advance over the past spiritual attainments. Thou comest like a silver deer, thou flees like a wind goddess, flitting through thickets of thy pure desire. These things are only images to thy earth. But truest the truth of that which in thee sleeps. What you are seeing, all this happiness, etc., etc., they are only images. You are not seeing the truest truth. She will discover that thing, she will know that thing. For such is a spirit, a sister of the gods. That is the spirit of Savitri, the sister of the gods. So, her spirit is a feminine spirit. Thy earthly body, lovely to the eye, thou art kin in joy to heaven's sons. And then he says, on heights of happiness living, doom asleep. You are on happiness in the seventh world, seventh heaven, and the doom is lying asleep here. You are not aware of it. As high as happy might the waking be, he for all time doom could be left to sleep. It is not going to be so. Doom cannot be left. It must come out. It has a role to play. It has a function. It has something to do. It cannot be left. Don't live in your dream world. You have to come out. He says, you know, by the safety of thy dreams, you are living in the safety of your dreams. But you have to come out of the dream and see the perilous world. And out of that dream, you have to wake up. Wake up to what? To the doom. He for all time, doom could be left to sleep. In other words, doom cannot be left to sleep all the while. It has to wake up. You have to come out of it. And then obviously, the story moves on. But Ashwapati answered to the seer. This is what Narada was telling, general description. He has already kind of given a preface of what is going to happen in those two lines. Now he says, but Ashwapati. Now Narada was not speaking to Ashwapati at all. <laughs> in fact, in a way, he was speaking to himself. At the most, you can say, to Savitri. He, he was speaking to Savitri. He cried to her. He cried to her. You see, all that thing. In, in, in that context, we are here. But Ashwapati answered. But Ashwapati answered. Now, of course, Nara does not expect an answer from Savitri. <laughs> yes, yes, she could have asked him, tell me what's the matter, you see. <laughs> huh? Your wife, what, what are you talking about? You let me know, you see. She could have, she could have asked him, you see. <laughs> what about, you see. But even before she comes out with an answer, Ashwapati interjects. He rushes through and answer to the seer. Because he was asking, Narada was asking, oh no, if doom could be left to sleep, that is a sufficiently ominous statement for the father in the normal circumstances. If Narada is making that kind of statement, naturally it is a concern for the parents. Why you are talking with that? And therefore, it is natural that he would immediately interject and ask. But Ashwapati answered, O oh, deathless sage who knowest all things here, if I could read by the ray of my own wish, 
I might see the steps of a young god-like life. This is my wish. In Savitri's coming, I can see the steps of a young god-like life. And you are talking about doom. If doom could be left to sleep, you see. So naturally he is going to ask questions. And life is in great. Because you are a deathless sage, you have got another vision. It has read and broken the hidden seals. Narad has already seen what is behind all that. And therefore he is making inquiry about things. Although in pauses of our human lives, earth gives, etc., etc., and he describes what Savitri is, her body like a brimmed pitcher of delight, so a jar of delight, Savitri herself, shaped in a splendor of gold colored bronze, as if to seize earth's truths of hidden bliss. Dream made illumined mirrors are her eyes, even as her body. Such is she within. Heavens, lustrous mornings gloriously recur. And then all beautiful things eternal seem and new to virgin wonder in a crystal soul. Obviously, she had discovered a soul, so everything looked to her all around. We look very sweet, very beautiful, very happy, very joyous. If but the joy of life could last, nor pain through his bronze note into her rhythm the days. This is what he is wishing. He is talking about doom. Behold her, singer, with thy patient gaze. In other words, he is requesting Naras to bestow his blessings on her. And let thy blessings chant on the spare child of his mission. Oh, the nectar of sorrowless life. This is kind of natural to the father's mission. And cast like a happy snare, felicity. And then, of course, he says that as grow the great and golden boundlessly on uh, Alakdanda's branch, on, on, on Alakdanda's banks. So cast. She, her felicity on men. And what is Savitri? A flame of radiant happiness. That is Savitri. The heart of God falls mute when she speaks. That is the quality of Savitri. And then, of course, he says finally, Yes, you are talking of doom. He says, But I am sorry. Of sorrow songs we have enough. This is what our life is. All along we have been hearing only the songs of sorrow, suffering. And therefore it says, once let unwounded pass a mortal life. He is asking, he is praying for blessings, that let her life pass unwounded. Obviously then, Narada keeps quiet, silent is sad. He, he does not know how to answer immediately, although he knows the answer, you see. But then he has to prepare then thing, and therefore innocently is asking, as if he does not know anything, yes, Savitri has walked into the palace, into the hall. Please let me know where she had gone. For what purpose she had gone, you see? He <laughs> yeah. is coming on the human level, you see. You see. <laughs> on what high mission went her hastening wheels, hastening wheels. Now, she is sitting in the palace, he had never seen her chariot rushing through, you see. But he has seen from above. But he knows hastening wheels because the way which she is rushing into the palace, Hastingly, she went to the palace to tell something immediately to her parents. So that he has sense already, you see. Made visible, paradise made visible in her eyes. The moment he looks at it, and then of course, the king answers, the red Ashoka watched her going forth, which now sees her return. So that is one year journey of Savitri. 
a sugar blossoms in the summer. So while she is walking out of the palace, the Ashoka was in full bloom. Now the Ashoka is again in full bloom and she has entered in. So Savitri was moving around for one year. It could be, of course, one year, it could be two years, but it will be <laughs> in multiples of years, you see. You see. So essentially one year. And what for? Led by a distant call, her way swift flight. Today, the summer morn, you see, again, that summer, you know, we have got this thing repeatedly appearing in Savitri, summer. The whole thing, meeting, etc., is taking place in the month of summer. Narad is coming here in the month of summer. So she had gone out in search of her life partner. She has come back now. The Red Ashoka has seen her going. It is seeing her coming back now. And what has happened in between, I don't know. That is what Ashwapati says. And therefore he says, he is asking Savitri, whom has thou chosen kingliest among men? Reveal. Tell us. Who have you chosen as your life partner? And Savitri now describes how she made Satyavan in the Sherva woods and how she has decided to be with him. Who is Satyavan, Divasana and all that thing you see. And she announces, I have met on the wild forest lonely worlds. My father has chosen. This is done. This is done. No further argument. I have decided. You may not be happy for an obvious reason that you are a king and you might be expecting me to find a prince. But here is a boy, here is a person who is living in a forest. Doesn't matter. I have done. This is done. My father has chosen. This is done. Now, of course, we have seen that the meeting of Satyavan and Savitri in the forest was again in the summer morning, maybe again just for four hours or so, because in the blazing sun, she is coming back, returning, noon. The high, on the high cupola of the noon, the marriage takes place and Savitri return. So maybe they were meeting there just for three or four hours. But she has found everything. She has discovered everything. Well, that is what we have here. But it is possible, if you want to really kind of rationalize, that Savitri goes to the Shalva forest. She has been traveling from place to place, staying in different palaces, in different places, in temples on river banks, in palaces, villages. She's traveling all the while. It is not that she suddenly meets somebody and finished. It's not that. Of course, it is there. But it is very likely that Savitri, why is Savitri coming towards these hermitages? group of hermitages, because she is going like that from place to place. Group of hermitages are there. This is another way of saying that possibly Savitri stayed there at least for a few weeks and they got mutually acquainted more and more intimately in the normal sense and then they decided to get married. That could be the normal. But all that thing is kept under suspense. It is immediate recognition of theirs who they are. Who is Satyavan? Savitri has immediately found. Who Savitri is that Satyavan has immediately found. And therefore, there is no question of their living together, being together, meeting there, or dating, or what you want to call it, for a few days or a few weeks. No, it was a, an instantaneous recognition of their system. This is done. Now, this is important. This is done. Savitri is not going to change the decision. It is the power of love that has awakened in her soul 
which is speaking it out, which is telling, yes, fixed, nothing more. And obviously, Ashwapati sees a heavy shadow float over the name, above the name. Ashwapati is a yogi. The moment the name is uttered, he sees a shadow over the head. But at the same time, he also sees that there is a sudden, stupendous light changing the shadow. A heavy shadow float about the name. This you can link up with what Naraj has said. Heavy shadow float over the name of Satyavan is linked up with he for all time doom could be left to sleep. It is a doom which Ashwapati is seeing over the head of Satyavan. The moment Savitri utters the name Satyavan, there is a kind of corroboration between what Narada is saying and what Ashwapati is seeing. Sudden heavy shadow and a doom could be left asleep. See, there is a kind of a well knitted argument in the whole of uh, uh, presentation of the epic, you see. And, but what we don't have in Narad is a sudden and stupendous light. Narad is living hanging with the shadow. But actually there is also behind that a sudden and stupendous light. Obviously, because Narada is seeing, he doesn't have to wait to hear the name Satyavan. Ashwapati, the moment he hears the name Satyavan, he sees this thing. Narada sees throughout the whole thing. Well hast thou done, and I approve the choice. Well, he has to approve it. <laughs> because he had told her, you go and find out your life partner and that should be all right for me. If you have chosen this boy, although he may not be of a stately, princely state and all that, I approve that choice. It is your choice you have made. Okay, yeah, I agree with that. Well has thou done. This is more perplexing. Why it is well? That he has not told. But his vision is telling, he sees the shadow, he sees the light, and therefore it is well. And then he says to Narad, he has explained to Savitri, but he is now turning towards Narad and says, O oh, singer of ultimate ecstasy, he is asking for blessings for his daughter. He wants Narada to prove the choice also. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, ultimate uh, ecstasy. Your uh, ultimate uh, ecstasy is uh, alright. Uh, ultimate. Today, in the immediate context, it may look to us doom. But ultimately, that doom is going to be an occasion of bliss. Ultimate in that sense. In the long process of evolution, march, etc., whatever you want to call it, it will, be, it will prove itself to be an ecstasy. Now, that is what we could see in the context of the narrative here. But this is also ultimate ecstasy in that sense of the story. But singer of ultimate ecstasy, this is a qualification of Narada. 
whatever he is going to see, the highest ecstasy of joy, of enchantment, of love, of beauty. There is nothing. Par excellence, you see. No plus ultra. Nothing is beyond that. He is the singer of that. The topmost happiness, ecstasy. <laughs> Lend not, and but therefore, because he says, lend not dangerous vision to the blind, because by native right thou hast seen clear. He saw the doom, he knows it, but we are mortal creatures, small people who don't have understanding of anything at all. We are ignorant uh, uh, people here. So don't give us that knowledge, you see. And as he sang, the demons wept with joy. That is the great thing. Demons wept with joy, as I told you earlier many times, that these four powers who have separated themselves from the divine source for the divine work taken upon them the entire burden of ignorance, of separation from the Divine. They are now happy that their task is going to be culminated. Now all this is in the context of Savitri finding her lover, Satyaman. All that thing is in the context of Savitri. In other words, demons weeping with joy, oh, Savitri has found her lover. And it is there now the transfiguration and ecstasy can begin from that point onward. So, all these things, the whole, whole presentation, preface, is basically towards what Savitri's discovery of Satyavan, meeting with Satyavan, is going to achieve. This is what is basically presented here in this event. And the defeat for which they hoped in vain and glad release from the self-chosen doom, see self-chosen, they had taken upon them the burden of the creation. Without that, things would not have happened at all. And return into the one from whom they came, from whom they came. Now he says, return. They are separated from the Supreme Source. They had become their opposite. Now with the discovery of love, the task is done. So I don't know how many millennia they must have waited for this to happen, you see. But now that it is going to happen, they are happy. This also means that they are going to return into the one. They are not going to transform them. They are happy to go back. Their task is done and they are happy to go back. And then of course, Narada enters the palace, the queen and the king, they receive him, he is reaching the palace early morning, so maybe he is offered breakfast also, <laughs> some fruits, some milk or whatever you see, <laughs> and then he sings, there for an hour untouched by the earthly seas. From eight to nine, he is singing now about the lotus heart of love. What the demons uh, like this, that they are, they are weeping with joy, uh, like that. So I mean, the demons, yeah. when they are weeping with joy, yeah. I, think I like that. I have a question. <laughs> yeah, surely, yeah. <laughs> because the mother says uh, either the um, forces get dissolved because they cannot be transformed, or they will be transformed. 
but now you just said that they will put people back. Yeah. Yes. But that means it's in between. So they will not be transformed, they simply go back. That's what you yeah, mean. they will go back, yeah. Means they will na, 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 you can put it this way, they had taken a certain role in the yes. whole process. That role is over, so therefore they are back. Yeah, so they leave the untransformed things behind. Yeah. But you see, when the whole creation goes into another mode, yeah. then it, these things need to be either transformed or dissolved. And they do neither. No, 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 they don't have inert there. You see, this is the process of the cosmic creation. How uh, from light came darkness, how from life came death, how from immortality, from, uh, from uh, uh, bliss came suffering and pain and misery, from consciousness, how it became inconscious. This is the process by which the whole thing has started. The four powers, consciousness, bliss, life, and uh, what are saying? Yeah, truth. Yeah, they they have become opposite. Now, now, so they they are the cosmic powers. They are not evolutionary powers. They are not evolutionary powers. They are there. They have taken their opposite. They have cut out themselves from the Supreme. Therefore, they have become opposite. Yeah, I understand. But, but, but Mama says in, in the transformation that's going on now, they either have to be transformed, okay, transformed, or they have to be dissolved. There is nothing in between. No, there is no question of transformation is. here. You see, let yeah, me put it here. Let me, let me give you the other example. Because death will be transformed and there's a lot of suffering has already given up the body. No, once once their uh, 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 inconscient presence is removed, yeah. then automatically all that thing disappears. Then what are you looking for? See, you take the example of what we have in Savitri's case alone. Now, towards the end, in book 10, Canto 4, mm -hmm. Savitri has vanquished death. She has conquered it. What happened to death? No. 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 He wants to go back into the night, night refuses to take him. He wants to go back into hell, hell refuses to take him. Ultimately, what happens? He is finding himself into the Supreme. He is now seeing himself what he was. He had taken a certain form for a certain purpose here. The Supreme himself had taken that form. So there is no question of transformation there. He has revealed himself now in his true state, in his Supreme state. Death. And it is that death transform death, if you want to call it, in that sense, who grants boons to Savitri. Do this, get this, get this, get this. And Savitri says, I want whatever you want to give me, I want not for myself, but for the soul of the earth. Now, it is not transformation of death, it is transfiguration. What he calls is transfiguration. He had assumed a certain role, a certain part to play. He had put on, if you want to call, a kind of a cosmic mask to hide himself and remain behind the scene. Now that mask is removed. Mask is removed is not transformation. Then now this is number one. What happens to the other three? Now we have falsehood, we have suffering, we have unconsciousness. Yeah. What happens with falsehood? No, yeah, falsehood, that's right, falsehood, yeah, truth, yeah, falsehood. Now, yeah. Yeah. Falsehood. yeah, but then, no, no. Once, once that thing is removed, automatically, you see, as long as they are present here in that form, mm -hmm. truth as falsehood, mm -hmm. life as death, mm -hmm. then all these things will be there. Yes, but once they have withdrawn, there is no base for 
misery, suffering, falsehood, there is no base for them now. Yeah. Because they are not there now, so their role is over, finished. Their role is finished, you see. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me that when Mother says dissolving, it is the same as returning into the one, because you cannot go anywhere in this universe. That is understood, yeah. You know, but you see, the, a lot of nations, he says... Uh, falsehood. Falsehood. He is not going to give up his body. Yeah, he will only do it when he has no other choice. Yes. So, then... Then will he be dissolved or will he be transformed? What will happen? He, he does not want to get transformed. Exactly. But so he, he can get dissolved. He can disappear. He can disappear. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of the suffering also happens. Yeah. He, he can disappear. Yeah. Disappear. So it's only yeah. death. Basically, yeah. an unconsciousness between. Yeah. See, in other words, in other words, he has still a part to play. He has a role to play still. Therefore, he's there. He is here still, not for nothing. It's in the whole process. Actually, the transformation of these four original powers, that cannot happen unless you go through the psychic evolutionary process. It is the evolutionary being who is a psychic who can get transformed. So anyway, I mean all this thing is in the context, you see basically the whole, whole thrust is here. Strife are on earth and joy that throbs behind the marvel and the mystery of pain. Marvel and mystery of pain. Pain is a marvel. It has a purpose, function. Bliss has become suffering for a purpose, it's a marvel. <laughs> to achieve something. All that thing in the context of lotus heart of love. And naturally, a mighty shuddering coil of ecstasy crept through the deep heart of the universe. Naturally, when he's singing, all the vibrations will go. See, he says now here, deep heart of the universe. Yeah, it is not that in the palace they're shuddering and happy and that kind of thing. The vibrations are spreading throughout the universe in all the planes of consciousness in all the planes of consciousness. That is the mystery of the lotus heart of love. Then we have the arrival of Savitri in the palace. As of a swift heart hastening Savitri, that is how she comes. Swift heart hastening. She is impatient to reveal to her parents that she had found the one whom she was looking for. And therefore, naturally she is impatient, swift, she wants to tell immediately. A happy wonder in the fathomless gaze changed with a halo of love. See, hello of love. It is that which has brought out a transformation in Savitri. And that is why her heart has become swift. Not only that, it has the sanction of the gods. It comes with that, you see. And then, of course, she sees now in the company of her parents, the says also there, saw like a rose of marble. That is what Narada is, 
rose of marble, a fiery sweetness for the son of heaven. And then he flung on her his vast immortal look. This is important. In fact, everything is important. <laughs> yeah. Vast immortal look, immortal, yeah. Her love may be in danger, but behind that there has to be the power of immortality. And that is what is the vast brahat, embracing everything. That is what is there. And then he is asking, who is this that comes? He is asking, I mean, he is kind of exclaiming to himself, who is this that comes? Wondering, oh, you have come like that, you see. And she brings down this glory of enchanted eyes. He has already seen the whole thing. And that is why he has timed his visit to the palace, just her arrival, one hour before that, you see. Earth has gold hued expanses. He is now describing the whole thing here. And all these are mysterious presences in which sound spirits immortal bliss is felt. Everywhere because of that is there. And they betray the earthborn heart to joy. And then Narada is turning towards Savitri and says, There has thou paused. Yes, I know you have gone there and met your future husband. And marveling, born eyes unknown, or heard a voice that falls that lie, born eyes unknown. Now, Savitri is not aware of it. But Narad is. Unknown is for Savitri. She is human. Something has crept in, has happened, the power of love has opened out. But still, she is going to see through human eyes. She is going to hear through human ears. Why that force that life? Force that life, you see. It has to happen. And then he is, of course, preparing Savitri slowly. Yes, you have been living in a very beautiful, very sweet world of happiness. It is kind of a dream in this earth. You are living as if in a dream world. And therefore, as long as you are in that dream, you are safe. You are safe. But you have to also come out of the dream and live in the context of this world. See things in the context of this world. Therefore, what it means is that the moment you come out of that dream of meeting Satyavan and all that, etc., etc., the moment you come out of it, the safety of the dream is no more there for you. You are going to meet something dangerous, perilous, unhappy. He is already hinting there. Yes, you are living the dream, you are happy there. And then he says, therefore, obviously, thou hast not spoken with the kings of pain. You are living the dream, you have not spoken yet, you have not met the kings of pain. Thou hast not spoken with the kings of pain. It means that, look, Savitri, soon you are going to speak with the kings of pain. He is telling that she has to meet the kings of pain shortly. Life's perilous music rings yet to thy ear far melodic, a rapid, grand, a song. Yes, 
you will hear the perilous music also shortly please impose not in the mortal stimulus breast the dire ordeal of poor knowledge he is warning narad to hold back his knowledge <laughs> here are not peaks of kailas and vaikuntha but he also says he has understood the whole thing narad but he also says all right you are the singer of ultimate ecstasy and you also know that the doom is going to be fall savitri is going to make the danger but don't give that poor knowledge to us if at all you want to give the four knowledge it is one condition on which you can give the four knowledge and that condition is if thou canst lose her grip then only speak if you have that power that authority to lose the grip of fate of doom yes go ahead and then speak otherwise don't give us that four knowledge in other words he wants that knowledge to be given and that grip to be loosened by him he must give, because the doom is there in fact that is one of the best possibility if the father can work out for his daughter she is going to meet doom but if there is somebody who can save it he will implore his help if thou canst lose her grip then only speak this is important and he says yes you have come with a purpose it is not a casual visit you had time very well in a certain context and there is a meaning there is a significance of your visit here and therefore you are here to give us that knowledge and loosen means naras contribution is a positive contribution in the life of savitri in that sense is perhaps you know perhaps from the iron snare there is escape we yes, do with there but there is an escape also possible perhaps the blindness of our will is fit okay he said and answered not obviously what can narad say <laughs> he is asking for for knowledge do he is also telling him yes you can come out and speak if you can loosen the grip narad is not only tightening the grip <laughs> he is rather making it more and more tight in order to relieve it fully to relieve it fully so the dialogue goes on and then suddenly savitri's mother comes on the scene in 1925 savitri's mother was introduced in the <laughs> epic <laughs> and she is here now to play her role you see <laughs> the human aspect of the narrative and she says narad you have come savitri has come such an auspicious moment for us and all that thy bright arrival you have come at a very auspicious moment therefore it's a bright arrival of yours savitri's mother is saying very positive sign in the visit of narad here is bright arrival now bright of course in the context of the story is something beautiful to happen bright also means narad is a bright person he is a heavenly being you see you are not like human beings who come and this then let the speech be nine of griefless fear confirm this blight conjunction not two stars blight conjunction not two stars now there are people who say that 
Savitri has come back after meeting Satyavan and her parents are there, Narad is there, Ashwapati is asking Narad, yes, Savitri has found this youth as a life partner and he asked Narad, what do you think of this in the common life? What do you think of this one? And Narada immediately cast the horoscopes of these two persons, <laughs> of Satyavan and Savitri, and tries to match whether the horoscopes are matching or not. The conjunction of two stars. <laughs> so this is taken as the astrological matching for the purposes of marriage. <laughs> yeah, just now the planets, you see. Yeah. In their sense. So people interpreted that Narada had cast the uh, horoscopes and then he's seeing the planetary positions and all that of these two horoscopes. And then says, yes, yes, it's all right. It's, everything is perfectly okay, but there's a little danger, but that also will pass. <laughs> That is how the general interpretation is given here. I will not name the person, but that is how it is given in one place, you see. <laughs> and sanction joy with a celestial voice. Here, drag not in the peril of our thoughts. Let not our words create the doom, the fear, etc., etc. And then she goes on. She tells him, look, we are living in the mortal world, full of suffering and grief and all that, and too heavy falls on man's heart, the shadow. Let this particular occasion be such that we are not subject to it. That is the natural desire of the mother for a child. And chance entanglement of an alien fate. Then of course she also says, Obviously, for perfect reasons, if there is an unseen doom, if the wings of evil broad over this house, then also speak, so that we can prepare ourselves in advance, avoid the danger. If it is good, no problem at all. If there is something bad, let us know that also. And so that we can prepare ourselves. But Narada answers, what help? Yes, I may give you the provision. In what way it is going to help you? Without that foreknowledge, you can pass very safely through the doom and all that. That is the first answer. None can refuse what the star force demand. Her eyes are fixed upon her piety aim. No cry of prayer can lure, turn her from her path. There is no question of my giving knowledge. Nobody is going to turn her face off. She has leaped an arrow from the bow of God. She has done that thing. The arrow cannot be now taken back at all. It has been shot. And then he says, the poet says, commentary, what narrows told the queen, his words were theirs who live unforced to greet. Unforced to greet. They are for celestial beings. We are forced to greet. They are not for us. These words. And Narada keeps quiet, but Savitri's mother, she is insistent. She is asking him, you are keeping quiet, it means there is something dangerous. And therefore, please let us know what that stealthy doom is. Who is standing in her way? What evil thing stood, smiling by the way, and wove the beauty of the Shalva boy? It is the evil who has taken the form of Satyavan, what is that evil? Let me know. Perhaps he came, an enemy, 
from her past to take the full revenge in his life. And of course, this is in the context of her daughter. And finally, she says, Even strangers' anguish rents my heart, my neighbors, my friends, my acquaintance. Even if I walk on the road and see somebody, their anguish rents my heart. And this, O oh, Nara, is my well loved child. So, Savitri. Hide not from us our doom, if doom is ours. She is pleading, let me know. <laughs> she is insisting. In fact, Narada was waiting for this. He had prepared the occasion for her to say this. <laughs> Hide not from us our doom, if doom is ours. He is happy that she has asked this thing. She has made this statement, you see. <laughs> of his own accord, he would not like to give. And then, of course, she says, common language, to know is best, however hard to bear. I don't know whether it's true or not, you see. Even if it is bad thing to happen, it is good to know that bad thing to happen. I don't know if it is good or not, you see. I think our it is an act of tremendous grace that the future is kept hidden from us. Is kept hidden from us. It is an act of tremendous grace. Because we have not really prepared ourselves to meet the future. We have not done enough qualifying sadhana preparation to face fate. Therefore, it is an act of grace. And Narad, as he was waiting all the while, maybe almost for one hour, <laughs> to make this utterance, <laughs> to deliver what he has to deliver. Truth thou hast claimed, and I go to thee the truth. Etc., etc. He now describes all the beautiful qualities of Satyavan, etc., etc., as we have seen. His speech carries the light of inner truth, the large-eyed communion with the power and all those things. He speaks very glowingly about Satyavan. A will to climb lifts a delight to live, etc., etc. His sweetness and his joy attract all hearts to live with his own in a glad tenancy. His strength is like a tower built to reach heaven. He got it, for it, from the stones of life. Yes, for it from the stones of life. That is how the evolutionary Satyavan has evolved to this point. For it from the stones of life. And then he is coming now to the business. He is such a glowing person, is a visitor. All loss if death into its elements of which his gracious envelope was built, shattered his vase. He was quarried from the stones of life, if that vase is shattered. If death, if, if, as if the earth could not keep too long from heaven a treasure thus unique loaned by the God, a being so rare of so divine a make. And then he is now making the announcement. In one brief year, when this bright hour flies back, his bright arrival was there, now this is the bright hour. He is making the announcement. And purchase careless in a branch of time, this sovereign glory ends, heaven lent to earth. Sovereign glory, that is Satyavan, it ends, lent by heaven. The splendor vanishes from the mortal's sky. Heaven's greatness came, but was too great to stay. It has to go back. And then he is now very specific. 
the year, the month, the day, the moment are fixed in the calendar of destiny. Samatsara, Masa, Kala, Muhurta, as the story of Vyasa in Savitra Mahabharata says. Muhurta, time, everything is fixed. And that is important because on the fated day, Savit is going to count back now the time, the year, the moment, everything is counted. Twelve swift wing months are given to him and her. This day returning, Satyavan must die. This is the important thing, as we have seen. Must die. He says must. And therefore it is the bright hour. <laughs> it is the bright hour. That he must die. Naturally, the human queen, she would not accept such a statement. When then can be heaven's grace? And she tells Savitri, Look, Savitri, this is what is being told to you. You have chosen somebody, but he will die one year after the marriage. Be wise. And make another choice. Choose once again and leave this fated hate. Death is the gardener of this wonder tree. Narada has described Satyavan as the wonder tree in glowing terms. But who is guarding the tree? Death. Love, sweetness leaves his pale marble hand. And she says, plead not that choice. For death has made it vain. It's a very powerful argument, you see. You are saying this is done. You said that when you are not aware of death. Now that you are made aware of death, would you still say this is done? Would you still say this is done? <laughs> But Savitri answered from her violent heart. Her voice was calm, her face was fixed like steel. Her voice was calm. She has already that yogic quality in her. Savitri. In spite of such a future being told to her, she remains calm. Is that not something very tremendous as a spiritual quality? It is. The word I have spoken can never be erased. The truth once uttered from the earth, ere effaced, my mind forgotten, sounds immortally, forever in the memory of God. Now she is giving the example. One that dies, fall by the hand of fate in an eternal moment to the God. Yes, the dice can fall only once. You cannot do it again. The chance is gone. She gives that example. In Vyasa Savitri, she gives three examples. She says, when the ancestral property is divided amongst the sons, this part for this, this part for this, this part for this boy, etc. Once the property is divided among the sons, then it cannot be reunited. Division is permanent. That is the social standard, you see. It is divided. That is one example she used. Then the second example she used is the moment the philanthropist gives some charity to somebody, he does not claim it back. Given. Given. You would not claim it back at all. Money is given. You will not claim it back. The third example she gives, the way you throw the dice, your chance is gone. Finish. Whatever comes, comes. Now, of those three examples, we have here one. In this case. My heart has saved its trot to Satyaman, its signature, adverse fate cannot. Its signature 
adverse fate cannot efface. Those who shall part who have grown one being within. See, those who, can they really part if they have grown one within? This is a question. We have grown within one. Finish. It's almost the opposite of example of Vedasa, uh, uh, where he said, he said once it is divided, it can't be united. Yeah. He's saying once it is no, divided, it can't can be divided. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. But the, the beauty here is, yeah, that's true, one who shall part, who has grown one within the whole issue is, within three hours they have grown one. <laughs> They made just for three hours <laughs> who have grown one being within. You see. So, can it happen within three hours? <laughs> it can happen in three minutes. Uh? It can happen in three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this also implies basically that uh, with that power of love which now got awakened in her. She has recollected the entire memory of the past. The entire past is now standing in front. Yes, through ages and ages and ages, we have been together. Can we remain separate now? Impossible. You see? Finish. Finish, yeah. But still, you can you can dissociate also molecules. You see, you take hydrogen, oxygen, prefer water. From water, you can produce oxygen, hydrogen also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Q K chemistry is reversible also. You see, <laughs> death's grip can break our bodies, not our souls, etc. Let fate do with me what shall or will or can. I am stronger than death and greater than my fate. Stronger than death. Where from does Savitri know that? She says, death is coming, but I know I am stronger than that. She has not done her yoga yet. But the power of love is so strong in her, it got awakened in her immediately. And she says, I am stronger than death. It is the power of love that has really come out and asserts itself that it is stronger than death. So that is the magic of Nara's word. It is because of Nara's announcement, disclosure, that suddenly, this memory, this past, everything has awakened in Savitri. Savitri has been set on the path of yoga. And then says, Fate's law may change, but not my spirit's will. I know how to change that. And then her mother pleads again, Look, Savitri, you are a very brave person. You are talking, like an immature person, you are a brava. <laughs> How do you know all that thing, you see? Oh child, the magnificence of the soul dwelling on the border of a greater world, thou lends eternity to mortal hope. When she is thinking that I am stronger than death, she is lending eternity to the mortal hope. She has a hope that she can win over death also. That is the mortal hope. But is that possible? Here on this essay, she used all those arguments then. And then of course she says <laughs> very cleverly as usual, love dies before the lover in our breast. Our joys are perfumes in a brittle vase. O child, will thou proclaim only the gods can speak what thou speakest. You are not a god, you are a human being. 
and you are speaking like God here. Who art thou? Thou art human. Think not like a God. For man, because you are not a God. For man, what is given is reason, pragmatism. Be pragmatic. Be true to life. Understand that thing. Be a human. And she says, because you are human, therefore live not your goal, the man's goal of life, of reason. Let my reason, my rational thought, you follow that and don't run after a beautiful face. If you follow the reason, then is your life a tranquil pilgrimage. Obviously, follow serenity, thank you, Krishna. In great, a, 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 sorry, okay. Then Savitri finally says, all right, all right, you have said all those things, but I don't agree with you at all. My will is part of the eternal will. This is the great assertion Savitri is making. My will is part of the eternal will. How does she know that? Again, as I told you last time, earlier, a little while also. She knows it because of the power of love. My will is part of the eternal will. My strength, etc., etc. I had discovered my glad reality beyond my body in another's being. I have found the deep, unchanging soul of love. This is my discovery. Now that is the magic of Nara's world. Savitri is realizing what she has really found because she has told that thing. And then naturally she says, therefore, I have no need to draw back from his arms. And he discovered paradise of love and journey into a still eternity. Only now, for my soul in Satyavan, I treasure the rich occasion of my birth. Only now, he had discovered that. I shall walk with him like God in paradise. I shall walk with him like gods in paradise. I shall walk with him. Where? Not in paradise. The way the gods walk in paradise, I am not going to walk like that in paradise. I am going to walk like that on earth. Here. I shall walk with him on earth. The way the gods walk, in paradise. The way the gods walk in paradise, in that manner I will walk with him. In fact, that is exactly what Savitri is demanding as a boon for the Supreme. The Supreme has told her, look Savitri, you have done a wonderful thing. We have come to the transcendental realm, into this world of beauty, love, joy, happiness and all that. Come and stay here. And be happy with your husband, Satyaman, here in this world. Savitri says, no, I don't need that. I want whatever I want, I want for the sake of the earth. I shall walk with him on earth like God's walk in paradise. If for a year, that year is all my life. And yet I know this is not all my fate. To live and love a while and die. That's not all my fate, I know that. For I know now again why my spirit came on earth. She has awakened to the mission of her life. Her avatarhood is coming out to play its role. My spirit came on earth. She says, my spirit came on earth. 
she is declaring herself as a avatar. Savitri is declaring herself here. Yes, I am the avatar. I have come here for a purpose. You are not aware of it, but I am aware of it now. That is the magic of Nara's word. He has made me aware of my avatarhood and who I am and who he is I love. I have looked at him from my immortal self. I have seen God smile at me in Satyavan. I have seen the eternal in a human face. That is what Savitri is asserting. And obviously, then none could answer to her words. Silent, they sat and looked into the eyes of fate. What can they do? Savitri is so positive, so firm in her resolve. She has disclosed her avatarhood. Nobody can speak anything now in face of that. She is asserting that I am the avatar. I know what to do. What part have I come here? You have no place in my work, so to say, you see. 